I could Skype, but I don't know. I'm not too sure. About that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have friends here? Huh? Yeah, I hope I sign oh, my name. I have some friends. I don't know. I hope so. Okay, so let me just tell you a little bit about how this program came about. It's a very long story. Um, <laughs> I guess a couple of years ago, my friend Monk here is a poet. And he publishes a wonderful calendar every year. It's called the Haiku Calendar. Beautiful. So one day I was reading through the biographies, and one caught my eye. It said Jeremy Dennis, uh, photographer, Shinnecock, Southampton. So I contacted him, and I was really excited. And he and I connected. He's sitting right there. Hi, Jeremy. Hello, hello, hello. And then we met, oh. and we, he came here, and we spent some time together. We decided to um, coordinate the exhibit of his photography, and then we took it further, and I wanted to speak here. So we were able to get Chief Wallace, and I am so excited. Everybody, let's welcome him. And here we are. So I thank you so much for coming to this program means a lot to me, and I'm sure we're going to learn a lot about something that's in our backyard that we don't even realize, at least most of us anyway. So welcome, and please take some cookies, refreshments if you like, and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Akwe ni tapia. Aya sura kwa kinta suwis. Tulopa smicha shayawa. Uncle John, I stood up for our rich pile. Who's the top to top? I need him a day with. Uh, my name is Harry Wallace. A queen of top yard is welcome, my friends and relatives. Well, greetings, my friends and relatives. I greeted you in my, in my language. I am uh, Uncle John McDavid Man. I'm a turtle clan, member of the turtle clan. Uh, my home is on Kachal territory, and I live on Pushmatuk territory, which is 15 miles that way. <laughs> okay? You are on traditional Uncachal Sintaki territory. You say Sintaki, you say Uncachal, they are, we are kinship of one and the same. In fact, one of the ancient chiefs, John Mayhew, one of the chiefs in Sintaki, his final place of resting, being an elder and respected chief in our territory, his final place of, of rest was what you may know as the Terrell River Sanctuary, down in Santa Riches. Anybody know anything about that? Well, it was a time, I feel like many, about 30, 40 years ago, when they tried to develop that territory, and they found an ancient village on that site. And so they decided the county, the county or the town, I forget which one of those governments, but in any event, they decided to purchase that land and preserve it. But it's the original territory of John Mayhew. And it is the, uh, John Mayhew was a Satake, known as a Satake chief, but he settled in the territory. So we're, our kinship is very connected. We're also connected with Shankar, Tunakar, Ola. Various, what you call 13 tribes on Long Island, which is really a misnomer because they have settled 13 settled villages, but they call them tribes because that made it easy for the colonists to take their land from them, <laughs> instead of finding someone that they could buy it from or take it from. In any event, we're here to talk about something more positive than that. We're talking about Wampum <clears throat> and the artwork of the Uncatuck Nation. That's us, the Kachuk Nation. Our territory <coughs> consists currently um, right along the Uswatuk village, which is known in our language as where the waters burst forth, where the waters meet. <coughs> and it's because if you look on a map, that's the only thing I wish I would have had for you. It's a map of Long Island. You look at the Ford River, you look at Uswatuk Creek, you look at the Riches Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. All four bodies of water pretty much abut that territory. So it's salt water, fresh water, and everything in between. That's where our village is. 
And that's where it has stood for over 6,000 years. We never left. Okay, so you guys are really newcomers. <laughs> <laughs> we have never left that territory. And we continue to this day. And whenever you find a situation where there's an ancient village, you will find clamshell, quahog shell. Everybody know? Who knows anything about Wampum? Anybody here? A little bit, you know, a little bit. You know it comes from a clamshell, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You also know that you know it as money, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that, right? Because you got that history lesson wrong. Mm -hmm. So that's the lesson they taught you, okay? Mm -hmm. But wampum is a word in our language meaning white clamshell bean. Purple clamshell bean is called siwam. And you may know that there is a place called siwam aki which references the land of Aki, meaning land of, the purple shell bee. You may know it as Siwanaki. That's not how it's pronounced, but that's what you know, right? But that, what, that's what that means. Siwanaki means the land of the purple shell bee, okay? And that is what Long Island is famous for. What you throw away every day is absolute precious uh, spiritual and valuable, okay? Because that's what we make <clears throat> our mountain from. That's what we make it from, right? And why is it long special Long Island? Because the thickest, darkest, and most colorful mountain comes from Long Island. It has been established throughout history. I didn't make it up. There are journals all throughout. You can Google them today if you like. Long Island Wampum, and it will tell you, going back to the early 1600s, 1700s, that the deepest, darkest, thickest shell of Wampum comes from Long Island. Okay, and it doesn't come from this, and it's made from the Quaha shell. And Uncle Chog, special the territory there, because we're famous for what's called black ones. See that? Yeah. It is so purple, it's black, right? Okay. And where does the color come from? It comes from the environment, it comes from the, uh, the microorganisms in the sand and in the water. And it's an old saying, you are what you eat, right? Well, to get that color, they eat those, or they sift through those organisms and they eat that. And this is where the color comes from. This is where Uncatuck territory you get this. We pretty much can tell where the clam comes from based on the color. You go out of Montauk and you look on the beach at night and it looks like it's red. I don't know if you've been out there and you've seen that with that sunset. Look along the beach line. Look, it looks like somebody poured some red paint on it, on the sand. And it's got, and it's like a, it's like a real, uh, like, a, like, a, like a wine reddish color, right? You go out on uh, the Conic Bay and you look along that sunset and it looks blue because the bump of purple is more blue than, than red out over there on the county bay of Shinnecock territory. So you go over there and you check that out and say, oh, those clams go to Shinnecock territory because they look purple, but they look, you have the bluish tinge too. And you go out in Arkansas territory and you see this. In fact, you go out at Smith Point and you look before they add the sand to it, you know, that they bring in for the tourists, and the natural sand, it looks like it's, looks like an oil spill almost because it's so dark. And that's the organism that feeds the clamshell that we have on our territory. Hey, so it's not live on, it's on the sand? Yeah, Smith Point? No, Smith Point's the ocean, but I'm just demonstrating that the sand that's natural to that territory mm -hmm. has a different look mm -hmm. than the sand that's natural to Shinnecock or Montauk or different areas. And if you look at it, you can see that, especially at sunset see that look, but it's different. And it's it's just unique. And that's 
the organisms that are alive. We believe, we say that it's alive, and it is alive because these things can live to over 400 years. So one year that's only three years old, that's like, Oh, what a shame. <laughs> We've got another 397 years to go. <laughs> it can live to over 400 years old. In fact, these, these beats. We made them recently, we made them a few years ago, but they're cut from, from shell that were over 400 years old. This white one here, it's cut from shell that was over 400 years old. And this one here, this uh, gray, dark one here. Okay. Sure. I'm going to get into that in a minute. How okay. old is this shell? Just a moment ago, the black one. Yeah. How old is the, the one that's in your hand? This one? Yeah. How old is the one? It's a relatively young one. Young yeah. One. <laughs> Probably, I don't know, maybe four years old. Oh. How do you tell the age of it? Uh, I'm not really quite sure, but that's to do with the hands. <laughs> with the ring? It's all three rings. It's a. Uh, and it's like a tree in the sense that the wider. The narrower the rings, the older it is. Do you know what your clams are eating different from the rest of the island and has it changed with climate, like with what's been going on with the ocean? Well, I can, I can tell because it has a different flavor. Yeah, no, I mean, the flavor, do you that? see it in the actual color of the shell? Do you see Because I know the flavor too, because I've been climbing out for okay. years, so is it, but can you tell from the shells are different? Over the years? Or? Well, you can tell the like, difference between a cockle and, uh, no, and that. the same type of shell that you They have usually, the rings are usually different, okay? And uh, Before you, can, you get an idea that there's different there. And in fact, what they're doing out east is they're planting foreign, or what I call foreign, not native shell to uh, Long Island. Yeah, they're seeding it out. And they're seeding it with uh, these grown shells that are not from here. And you can tell it's different, and it tastes different. And they're worried to kill them all off. And they're worried that they're going to kill all the natural shells. And that's another story that's not pleasant. That, uh, that if you want, I can talk to you about because when we put our shell back in the water, you know, they get mad at it. And us. But what we're doing is providing the environment's ability to restore itself because one of these sits through 50 gallons of water a day. So when you were over, when you were over killing, when you were over hunting and over harvesting, this creature, this this living thing, you're basically killing your water, poisoning your water. The blue point. Yeah, the blue point always. Got oysters do the same thing. So when you were over harvesting these living things, you were poisoning yourselves slowly. Because that's how much water it sits. It doesn't harm the being. It, it envelops it and it covers it in a, uh, a, um, a um, secreted uh, um, mm -hmm. animal. And it, uh, it doesn't kill or harm the animal. And it breaks it down into the component parts that are not harmful to the environment. And then it sips it right back up. Can I ask a question? Yeah. What color is the outside? Black. Is it black? Shell's cracked, that's why I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. That's the back can side. You can tell somebody. Yeah. Can, you, can you pass it around? Well, it's, this one's cracked. So oh, I can pass okay. it around another one. Yeah. You know, I don't want you to. Uh, I should have brought another one, but I only had this one inside. Yeah, that's okay. I was in a hurry because you, you only told me, like, when? <laughs> Got <them> more time. <laughs> okay. So. What do we use the wampum? What's the purpose that we use wampum for? The wampum that tells us many things. It, 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 we use it to tell a story. We use it to record history. We use it to recognize the authority of our leaders, our chiefs and our clan mothers. We use it to commemorate a particular event or an occasion. 
And we use it to win because it makes us look good. Right? That's all of those purposes, all of those uses. We also train it with it. You know about the Iroquois and the wampum belts and all that, but they're the, we call them, you know, they call themselves the wampum keepers. Well, we call ourselves the wampum makers, see one of And because they can't get this where they live, so they trade it with us. They trade it with us for all the wampum. And it goes back many, many, many years before European contact. Yet they were able to hold on to and retain those belts that were important to them. We've been able to hold on to a few of them that were important to us as well. But one of the things about the wampum belts is it's not to hold up your pants. It's to, it's to record something about history. So, I'll give you an example. This is a very common, this is a replica of a very common belt. Come on in. Very common, hello. I have some friends here. I think I got some friends here. This is called what they call an, um, an alliance belt, a friendship belt. This is an actual replication of a historical belt that was given to General, I mean, President Washington's General uh, Pickering in 1794. This belt was given to him to commemorate the Treaty of Canandaigua. But this is a belt that's very common because it uh, represents friendship. As you can see, there are two parallel lines that go diagonally along the, 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 a white, a white uh, background, meaning white, that's so much white like that is a, it's a representation of peace and friendship. And you see the purple ones. That's when you know there's, and I'll show them in a minute, that's when you know there's something else going on there. And this is an alliance belt, it's a friendship belt. Given to General Pickering as a demonstration of friendship between the Indians of New York, not just the Iroquois, there were Algonquin people at that conference as well. Algonquin chiefs that were represented there, they were friends and allies of the Iroquois, and they were all part of that agreement, all part of the friendship agreement. And so this was given to General Pickering. The original is at the State Museum, in Albany, you can go up there and you can see the original. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Who was in charge of uh, um, men or women in making, uh, designing these and, and putting them into such an attractive uh, manner? Was it the women or the men? And were the men in charge of it once it was completed? Uh, who, who kind of... Now you know the answer is the you? women, right? I know. <laughs> 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 the point is, everybody was involved in the manufacturing, but the ones who made the belt to us, the ones who made the belt, were the women. And that's because they, they were able, they, they put the design together and it was, these belts are woven, okay? So they were able to do that. And as you know, with the, regardless of what size, if you made a bead that was bigger or smaller than the other one, it was not thrown away because it's very difficult to make those beads. So they kept them, and the, the true art of making belts was taking all of those different sizes and making it so that everything was even on, on the ends and the designs were, were even as well. So it was, it was definitely a work of art. It still is today, yes. Did you take found shells or did you harvest from that? Harvest. In fact, if you look at some of the digs that they've done, like at the Turrell River or out here, I think it was over in um, Tonkin, um, and at, at the Pelham Bay Park, they just found what they call shell mittens. Out in Cartron, I think they found what they call shell mittens. What are shell mittens? Big piles of broken shell. That's what mittens are. And if you find a shell mitten, chances are you'll find a village. Okay, so they call them mittens, but they're actually big piles of shell that people were there harvesting and manufacturing wampum. And the entire village was involved in that process. Again? Did the process bring or did you use the leftover shell for anything else or was it specific? Try to use all of it. In fact, yeah. there's some demonstration of what we do with as much of the shell as we have. But we didn't use it all. Okay, and then what happens is a lot of times you take that, put it back in the water and it reattaches 
a whole uh, reef of activity and life forms and formulates around it. We've done that and you see, you know, crabs have come there, um, fit, uh, you know, small fish and all that will recreate life all around the ocean because it basically uh, reconstitutes itself back into the waters. Okay, so this is a uh, friendship belt. <coughs> This is not a friendship belt. Okay? This is all purple. This represents a belt given to the governor of New York, Governor Andrews, in 1676 by the Uncontrolled Chiefs. It's recorded and documented in his notes. This was a belt. Of, this is what's called the warrior's belt. And this is given as a sign of a warning. And he gave this to the governor. The Shankachov chiefs gave this to the governor. It's a representation that his people were interfering with our way of life, our way of hunting and fishing, primarily fishing. Okay, it's recorded, it's documented, you can look it up. Callahan's um, History of New York. I think it's um, volume 14. Uh, it's, and it was a, it was a result of a, a year-long negotiation. 16, started in 1675, and it ended in, I believe, May of 1676, where treaty was entered, where the governor of New York and the Court of Assizes, which was the highest council in New York, met at what's called Fort James. It used to be Fort Amsterdam, it used to be known now known as New York City. And this belt was given to the governor as a representation that if they did not change and get his own people under control, there would be a problem. Okay, and the reason why they, they, rec they recognized how serious it was, was because in Massachusetts at that time, what was going on there? Anybody have an idea? I know these guys do, but anybody else have an idea? Have you heard of King Philip's War? Massachusetts, Wampanoag War. Well, they basically almost entirely de uh, destroyed the entire uh, colony of Massachusetts. They pushed the uh, colonists all the way to, to an edge of Boston until they were able to um, overcome uh, Philip with with their Indian allies. And uh, that was going on at the time. And so the governor of New York did not want that happening. New York colony. So he took this, very, this threat, this, this warning very seriously. So ultimately in 1676 they made it to a treaty. And they were given, he was given, 1676, a white one belt, which is a representation of peace. Probably, although there's not, a, there's not a description of the belt itself, I venture to say it was probably something like the friendship belt. Some white marble. Okay. So yes. How long does it take to weave one of those? Uh, this one, I think. Well, it depends on how much time you put on it there. But I would say, um, I'd say a few weeks. This was uh, this is not sinew. It's imitation sinew, but it would it would originally would have been made out of sinew, and uh, probably beads would probably would have been bigger than this. Um, it would have been more like this size, you know, four by eight millimeter, much bigger, each bead. And, uh, and the one that was given to the governor was like that about that. That long, that I mean, that wide rather, and three and a half feet long. Which I think that's three and a half feet. Right? Right? Three and a half feet. Right? So that's how long. It would be. That's what we give it to go. Love you. Okay. Uh, so that was a. Um, 
representation of some historical belts that were um, um, part of the history of, of New York and the history of Long Island. We had some others that this is something that was made more contemporary and uh, it's not a historical belt, but it was done by my daughter as a, rep as a representation of current Long Island history and her importance in Long Island. Let's see, I, I give this lesson to the fourth grade class at Seven Ridges every year. So I'm gonna see if you guys are smarter than a fourth grader. Okay? Let's figure this one out. Can we figure this out? What do those lines represent? What do you think they are? What are they? Waves. Waves. All right. Very good. You got a good start. Okay. Now, how many are there? Twelve. Thirteen. Thirteen. Where's the guy at thirteen? That's what I'm Okay. Thirteen. So she made those waves represent the thirteen communities of Long Island. Okay. Now, what's that figure on the top? Turtle. Turtle. That's right. Representing Turtle Island. Okay, and that figure on the bottom? That's a clamshell. So my daughter thought that this, this is her, that's being an artist, and you're gonna have an artist coming up. I'm not an artist, I'm just a, I'm like this guy over here, I create artists, I don't, I'm not one myself. <laughs> but yeah, being an artist, she, she envisioned that this would be a representation, her representation, of the Montauk Confederacy. So she calls this Montauk Confederacy in her way. Because it represents all of us here on Turtle Island. Where's Turtle Island? You're on Turtle Island. You're on Turtle Island, yes. And uh, as part of our creation, this was all created on the back of a turtle. So this is Turtle Island, okay? So, we also have this of, um, a, an artist uh, philosophy as well. Being, it's not the two rule welcome, but it's the concept that we travel along parallel paths, but we do not intersect and not interfere with each other. That's what the two rule welcome is. But this is not it. This is just a. Um, a contemporary look that was designed by an artist using our beads. His name is uh, General Grant, and he used our beads and he, he came up with this design as his reflection of not interfering with the lives of our lives one with the other. Okay? So. Other uses besides just uh, uh, it's recording historical events, and so you can make some beautiful things out of it. It's a bracelet made out of wampum beads and fresh water uh, clam beads, fresh water uh, pearls. Okay. Also made out of uh, hishi beads, <coughs> wampum made out of hishi beads. Make, make, make bracelets for that. We also, these are simple things. I also made some, this was done by Galen Droppo's granddaughter, who is an expert in um, porcupine quilt, and my daughter, who was an expert in wampum. And they collaborated on these. These are actually earrings. Right? With the post uh, ending on the back. But it's a combination of porcupine and wampum. And some seed beads on the end. The, uh, the, the local American Indians are trained with the upstate Indies because porcupine will have a name. You know. Porcupine was the uh, what was used as part of the decorations that we had because you didn't have Czechoslovakian beads. Yeah. So you used, you used all of the, uh, the natural items that were there and natural dyes. Okay, so we did a lot of trading with uh, upstate, beaver, porcupine, these, whatever 
They didn't have an upstate, didn't have any whale either, but they had whale bone up there. Yeah. The Navajo had one. Okay. The, the Navajo had a wampum on them. Wampum traveled all the way across the, 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 this continent, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. In fact, I got a copy back in uh, 2001. They were commemorating the 200 year anniversary of the uh, 2001-2003 of the uh, uh, Lewis and Clark expedition across the Missouri River, all the way over across all the way to Washington State. They went down and found what they were looking for the waterway going across, and they found what the Rocky Mountains, right? Mm -hmm. But in their journals, um, there was a list of the supplies in the journals, Lewis and Clark. I didn't bring that book with me. But in the back of it, it has all the different supplies. And there was one section in there that said, gifts to Indians. Okay? Number one on the list of gifts to Indians was five pounds of white wampum. So Lewis and Clark, and who is their principal guy? Don't tell me Charbonneau. I don't even want to hear it. They were led by a pregnant woman. Right? Right? Well, the they, they, uh, Shoshone call it Segagawea or Sacagawea. That's who led that expedition. Okay? And she's not gone. Yeah. Or she knew about one. Is there any way to specifically trade? Like, how is this ordered? Because scale weight would be hard. So it would be done in strands and handed over. Like, how would you trade actual quantity? You would trade in strands. Now, we don't make a fat. The strands were probably a fathom long, which was. Think six feet right. or thereabouts. We would not trade in fathoms. What we do is we trade in the traditional sizes of commerce today, about 15, 16 inches. So that's how we trade. Yeah. Uh, this is a, a strand of Hishi beads. And the weight would be a relatively the same. Per this would be, what's that? This would the be. The weight a, would relatively be the same for a strand if that was, it was built the same. The weight? Would relatively be the same, the weight of the. I'm not sure I understand you. Yeah. A fathom uh, six feet would be a hell of a lot heavier yeah. than this. Yeah. Yeah. So it would reflect that way. This is this gets to be really heavy because that shell is it's quite dense. So it's how do you get the shell to be how does that work? Okay, well, it works very hard. Yeah, I'm sure. So you know, we cut and I, I had a board here, but I didn't have enough to bring the, the board with me. But what you do is they we, uh, we take the shell and the first thing they would do was cut this back off. Cut the back piece off. And if you just, especially if you're looking just to get purple, and then you take that and you cut these in what's called blanks. You cut these lines going across, and then you would cut them going across depending upon what size you want. So you would, you would cut them in either squares or rectangle, then you would shave the back side off of that too. You would shave that side off, okay? Because you take the brown away from the back of the bead. And then the way that they would spin it was that they would, get, they would have a stone and they would have a groove in the stone and they would rub that against another stone and they would spin that and get the round shape that they wanted, that, that you want. Okay, and then they would have a bow drill that was uh, it was probably maybe about this big with a, a cross a member of a cross and a tied to sinew and used with and the, and the drill bit was a piece of a whalebone perhaps a baleen or, some, or a piece of bone sharpened and they would drill through the uh, bead to get uh, to create the hole. Okay. Nowadays, our equipment is different. We use diamond drill bits. We use a uh, modern uh, spinning wheel that has uh, two anchors on the side to hold the bead. And we use a Japanese style drill to drill, like the Japanese drill pearls. We use a Japanese style drill to drill the holes. Does anyone do it traditionally anymore? Or? Sure. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to get the price for these or there would no. be. We use that, the people that do it, and they do use that as demonstrations. I've seen 
A lot of different people do demonstrations of that. And sometimes they uh, do that at museums, you know, show how that's done. But it is not an easy process. And they call that the, uh, um, the guys that work with it, they have a bucket. I don't know, about maybe this big, right? And they, uh, this is their, they call it their bucket of tears. That's so all the shells they worked on that didn't make it through the process. And they save that because eventually they use it to make, like, um, like there are some people who, artists who want just chips so that they can they do like, uh, do like maybe a Zuni inlay type of, uh, uh, you know, ring or something like that. And that's what they use for that. But that's their bucket of tears. And it's a big bucket of things that didn't work out. Yeah, because it's not easy. Yeah, you have your hand up or you just scratching your hand? Um, the painting over there? Um, huh? The painting over there, the turtles, that's supposed to represent the medicine wheel? I'm not understanding what you're saying. The painting um, of the turtle, is that supposed to represent the medicine wheel of the inside? This is a symbol of our nation. This was created by uh, my cousin about about 30 years ago as a, as a, as a symbol of the nation, which is a Turtle clan here, and you have the four direct the colors of the four directions. So when you see the four direction colors there, that part would, would you would reflect you as a medicine wheel because you have the colors of the east, yellow, south, red, west, black, and blue, or purple as uh, north, and then a cluster turtle representing not only Turtle Island but also Uncle Joe Nation Turtle Clan. And then inside there, you have the whale, you have the corn, sun, and the deer, grandmother deer. Okay, that's what that represents. And so you have those symbols representing our ancient way and our contemporary way. So if you have the medicine wheel, if you're seeing the four, if you're thinking with the four colors of the four directions representing the medicine wheel, that is only in that reflect in that sense. Yes? Can you explain the term Turtle Island? Turtle Island and our creation, our creation story is that all of our life was, before this, this was all water. My, uh, uh, the new, uh, we like to say this was after the flood, but before this was all water here. And the turtles and, and our story of creation of man, the, uh, the turtle was, uh, was the principal being that, that was responsible for creating the landmass. And uh, they asked, uh, Turtle asked the, uh, the um, otter to go deep into the ground, into, underneath the water, and bring up the mud that to recreate uh, the, the earth, the, the, the land, the soil. And the otter did that. And the, and the turtle expanded, and the land expanded, and the land grew. And it grew and grew and grew and created the space that we are now. And all things grew from that. That is the beginning of life, of man, on Turtle Island. So Turtle is a very powerful symbol amongst that is also a clan. It's one of the one of what we consider, what I consider to be one of the four original clans. And, and that's where it comes from. Could you explain the difference uh, between a, a clan, a nation, a tribe, or whatever the divisions you may have? You get into politics now. I don't <laughs> believe in the concept of tribes. That's like a, you know, a denigration of who we are as people, nation people. Okay, okay today as they call them First Nations people, I believe that's more of an accurate sense because we have as much sophistication politically, government, economic. And all of those things is anybody else. Okay, the difference is, is that we did not war to take territory. And we did not hunt to a virtual extinction. We had a concept that was called one spoon, one bowl, which was that we would utilize the resources that were necessary for survival and for our, and for our well-being, but we were not hurt to extinction or to, or to the termination of others. Okay, that was our philosophy. But as far as a nation, as far as a, uh, a clan is concerned, a clan is a representation of kinship. 
when you have somebody, and it's also how you organize society. How do you organize society? Your society is organized on the basis of the family unit. Single family unit, mother, father, children, siblings, it's it, right? And if they, you're not included in that family unit, you don't exist in, in your society. You don't, you think about it, okay? You're always concerned about what are you gonna do with your, with your, when your grandfather gets too old? What are we gonna do? Well, we never had that problem because we knew what we were gonna do. We were keep <coughs> we take care of him because he has wisdom and knowledge and she has wisdom and knowledge. Okay, so the leadership of those clan mother responsible for raising all of those people in the family and selecting the leadership, future leaders of the nation, because why? They watch the children grow. Okay, so it's kinship. So you can go anywhere in this country. If I'm a turtle clan and I go to Seneca Nation country and I meet somebody who's a turtle clan, we're a relative. We're connected by kinship. The nation, Seneca Nation, is separately distinct, but as far as the clan is concerned, we're related. Now, you couldn't marry inside your clan because your clan was a relative. Okay? So, it's the way society was organized, it's the way our culture was organized. Okay. Now, the uh, nation, what you call it, the tribe, I don't believe in using that word tribe because I believe that's a denigration of our political and government structure. Because our government structure was as sophisticated as anything we have. As a matter of fact, the governments in this country were more democratic than anything that Europeans had ever came up with. The concept of democracy, you may think it came from Plato. Good luck with that one. Okay. Concept of free, open, and and honorable, non-enslaving people, that is not a European concept. Okay, so as a matter of fact, the documentation in the meetings of the, uh, of the, uh, um, the Continental Congress, they're looking at the documents and I think it was uh, somebody from the Iroquois Confederacy that they were able to overcome it. Franklin and Jefferson and Adams all looked at the, the Confederacy concept of organization. And they looked at primarily the New York and the uh, uh, Iroquois Confederacy, but not just Iroquois, but primarily Confederacy. And if you look at the original document of the Constitution, what was it called? Anybody know? It's called the Articles of Confederation. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> right? And the reason why that was unworkable, you know why? You know why it was unworkable? Because in order to agree on anything, it had to be unanimous consent. The 13 colonies could not agree on anything unanimously, but that's how government functioned in our territory, by consensus, unanimous consensus. That's how democracy functions, okay? So they had to change that and make it what? John, mostly your job. So, in any event, that's what. Um, and that agreement, I don't have that belt here, but representation of that belt. But that agreement is com is uh, is solemnized in what's called the Five Nations Belt. I know you've seen that. I probably don't have. I have probably have it on my phone. I can dig it up real fast if I'm. Uh, I'm really skilled, generally, you can probably bigger it better than I can because <laughs> I'm not that skilled. <laughs> but if you got, right, of the, of the Iroquois Five Nations Belt, it has a symbol of the uh, five houses on a purple background because it was at the end of a conflict. And the center of it was is a tree. And they all came together, what they call under the tree of tree of peace, and, and established the five nations. Five nations, but yeah. yeah, okay. So, yes, sir. Oh, yeah, it's accurate because I had learned that the word tribe comes from some kind of Roman government political thing, so it's from Rome. So, the problem is, people's tribe is not right, not accurate. Uh, I'm not sure where that word came from. I thought it was from some uh, anthropological concept coming from the French. 
Instead of being a name and shit, yeah. Yeah, excuse me. Instead of <laughs> <naming> stuff, <laughs> you know? So, you know. Europeans um, call the Arabs. Huh? Europeans <coughs> call the Arabs tribes. They too, call the Arabs the tribes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. But they always call non Christian people. They denigrate them by calling them the, the names that are, you know, it's, you mm -hmm. call somebody a nation, things have to be dealt with in a certain way, right? <coughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, so then, yes. So, are all people of First Nations across the country all Turtle Island people? All people, First Nations across the country, Turtle Island people, yes. So, we have, uh, we talked about, uh, the bells, we talked about, I don't know how much time do I got, I guess what, to two? However long you want. However long you want, okay. And of course, we make a uh, use bottle because we want to look good. Right? Okay. This is uh, made out of nothing but wampum, right? Hishi beads and two beads, combination. Okay. Then you have Something more dramatic than that. Somehow that works, right? Okay, here we go. All right. This is a what the Navajo would call a squash blossom necklace. But it's instead of made out of, instead of using turquoise, <coughs> they use wampa. Okay? That's pretty good. All right? And this was for sale for, on sale here all month. Of course, you have things that we do. Like rings. See? Everybody see? Yeah. <laughs> so there's some more contemporary uses. Right? Make us look good. I got one myself. Yeah. What would you say that? Yeah. Like, with a specific, would you wear a specific wampum for a specific job you had within the, the clan or? Meaning hunters or they're identifying more for everybody has a, a function that they can better at, but we all we all go through different phases. At first, we're infants, and we're children, then we're adults. You know, then we we develop certain skills to survive as adults. We become hunters, we become fishermen. Some are better fishermen than hunters. Some are better. Um, then you, you become, you know, you become a spouse, okay? and, you, and then you become a father or a mother. So those relationships, some are better at it than others. So then you have, you know, then you go beyond that. Then you become, uh, you become a, a uh, maybe a council member, maybe a representative of the people. And then you become an elder. Okay. So you, you, have, you take on all of these different roles, and some of us are better at it than others, and that is, is recognized by the people. They recognize that. They recognize those roles and what functions that you do best. Yeah. I know that I traveled, when I, as a kid, you know, I didn't know and learn much about my language and those things as a child, but I knew my uncles took me everywhere. And I had a lot of them. I had seven of them, and they took me everywhere I went. Okay. Do you want to go to the ocean there? You want to learn how to clam? Sure. You want to learn how to fish for eel? Sure. I did all those things. I, why? Because I just wanted to get the heck out of the house. <laughs> No, they just took me wherever it was. And I, and they, you know, I spent more time in the summer at my uncle's house than I did at my own. And you know, 
And the thing is, by action, not by accident, I don't think, but my brothers and I, we treat their children and mine in the same way. They can stay, as long as they abide by the rules, they will stay at my house, no problem. If they go visit, you know, my cousin, not a problem. They are as much welcome in that house as they are in mine. And we, not by, you know, oh, we're gonna plan this out, but just because that is how we grew up, that's how we were taught. And so we don't have that problem. And relating to the rest of the family. It's not a big deal. It's natural. Okay, and let's hope that's how we teach our children. Okay? Yes. Can you tell us the process you had to go through in order to become chief? No. Please? <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's a it, the system of uh, being elected. It's not being elected. It's electoral. It's a combination of electoral and traditional in the sense that um, it's a, you know you get you get elected to the position. Right? You have to run for it. And you have to go through a process, and it's very politicized in one sense that like they have it today. Except that our process only takes a month. Doesn't take two years like yours does. And. Uh, but it's a combination of things because you still, if you really want to be elected chief, you need the represent, you need the support of the leading women who represent families on our territory. There's no way to get around it. If you don't have that support, I get it. You know, because it's still that way. There's basically five or six, uh, I'd say about six families now. And the way the women who lead those families function in the same way that clan mothers do. They select who they want to be their leadership. And I don't know how it is out of uh, the Eastern City Company. That's how it works here. If you don't have their support, get it. So I've just had that, been able to maintain the support of, the, of those, uh, those families based on that, for the most part. Until I do something they don't like, and then <laughs> start all over again. <laughs> Sometimes it's very rewarding. Sometimes it's just, why am I doing this? Just, but sometimes it's really rewarding, like when we deal with the language stuff and the, working with the, you know, with the different parts of education, and, you know, and, and traveling and taking trips and you know, doing those things. It really is a lot of fun. And then you get to the ugly stuff. Yeah. Yes? Do the women sit at the table when the chief is elected? The administration of the client takes. Um, say, yeah, yeah. What you and are there any? Women are in charge. There's seven council members, five <coughs> council members. Okay? Are there any chief? I recall it way back. 40 years ago, when I did the history of, of the American uh, Indians, there were tribes that were, excuse me, clans or nations that were led by women. Is mm -hmm. that not true? That's, that's true. Yeah. yeah. And there are some women, uh, chiefs and chairmen, in, in, uh, in, in, in today. In today's, uh, uh, I think Wilma Mankill from the Cherokee Nation is a famous uh, mm -hmm. German. Okay. Uh, was, yeah. the word. but there are others as well. And um, uh, in our rules there, the woman can't be chief, but they could be um, leaders of the nation, could be trustees and so on. We've always had that issue. Always had not uh, non issue with it. And like I said, out of the five uh, councilmen, out of the seven councilmen, it was five of them were women. But a woman couldn't become chief in, in your life. Not under the current rules and regulations. Okay. Right. But they have what they call, uh, uh, there's a word that they use, uh, woman of honor. And, uh, and uh, that is just as much a powerful position. As a matter of fact, uh, the chief's actual responsibilities are to do these kinds of things and to represent the nation and in the public domain, but as far as the authority to 
comes from, it comes from the university councils. So, um, and they still hold on. It's okay, I'm not right with it. Because, you know, having the concept of power is, uh, is really, uh, you know, it's really fake evil. Anyway, nobody has any real power. <laughs> Yeah. Some, someone asked a question before, and I, didn't, I want to know if you can talk about the answer more. It was something about, are all Native American nations today descendants of Turtle Island? Did, how did I complete Who asked the question? Yeah, I wanted to know if all first <laughs> no, nations in our country are considered Turtle Island. I don't know. asked if the, the, all the area was considered Turtle Island. I said yes. Oh, this area. Yes. I meant like our nation, not our not whole entire nation. Turtle Island. Oh, you mean Long we Island. originate in Asia? Is that your plan? Is that your question? You mean only Long Island? Okay. Long it's Island. Island. It's the Turtle Island is what? It's the continent. Are you talking about the entire continent? North America. North America? Well, North America. Well, North America. Yeah. well North America. you know that whole concept of the land bridge. Is every day they're punching holes in that story every day. Now there are some people that came across, but now they're finding South American and East Coast villages that were over fifty thousand years old. Okay, now there wasn't any land fifty thousand years ago between uh, Asia and North America. It was all in the water. So where did they come from? There was no island. There was no Long Island almost that long ago. Well, it was back and forth. Yeah, it was cool. Every once in a while. Yeah, I thought dismissed the least. <laughs> like, my, like my nephew could do said, there once in a while it was a flood. <laughs> it was an ice age, but it kept going back and forth, right? <clears throat> and in fact, they're learning now that at some point, 100,000 years ago, there were major, major, um, I wouldn't even call them villages, call them cities. Okay, but because there was a, a uh, cataclysmic event, the water table rose to a point where they were buried underwater. A lot of underwater history that we don't know about. Every year, they come across new stories about that, and they punch holes in that. So my feeling is, we were always here. We started from here, and we always will be here. That's my and uh, I have as much evidence of that as any other, anybody else. Is that, that your question? Is that what you're asking? No, I was... Okay, I'm not <laughs> sure what you're asking. No, 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 I was confused before when you said, yes, we're all part of um, Turtle Island. But if you went, I mean, there's other creation myths. And if you went to other parts of this country, wouldn't somebody say, oh, yeah, no, we're totally connected to Turtle Island? Okay. Like... Okay, I'm with the day with, right? And, we, and our teaching is this, all creation stories are true. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we're taught that is because no one story is better than the other one. Mm -hmm. So if that's, what they, if that's their story, I don't have a problem with that. And it's true. That's not what I meant, I just okay, wanted to then, know. So what is it that you're... Yeah, you're I, I don't understand your question, then. So it's okay, I don't understand. understand. But okay. I think she means that um, they're all, or you're all, or we're all, connected and related, all of us, no matter where you're from. Is that what you mean? They're saying, no, but that's okay. they're that's trying right. to, is Long Island Turtle Island? Yes. Is, is New York State Turtle Island? Yes. Okay. That's, San Francisco's part of Turtle Island? Yes, it is. Thank yeah, you. that's what I part of Okay, all right. We're all part of this. They, I, I know, was there a specific term for Long Island? I just gave it to you. Siwa Aki, right? One of the words for Siwa Aki, which is land of the black wampum bee, black shell bee. Okay, that's one word. Okay, there's another word they use. It. Sometimes people have referred to it. I'm learning the language more and more. They have a, um, they have a uh, word of Zohar Aki, which is the southern land. So I want to represent the southern direction. Well, um, then there's another word that a common uh, misunderstanding is called homo aki, right? We call it pomonaki, right? Um, and it does not mean land of tribute, okay? 
please don't use that anymore. It doesn't mean that. Whoever told that story is the same one who told you that Manahata means land of inebriation. What? Okay? Because that's what they use to explain what Manhattan means. Right? None of those are true. Those are false uh, concepts. Okay? Homo is a sea god. Homo aki represents uh, the best translation would be the land of the uh, sea god or spirit island. So we're talking about water. That's the closest I could get to the translation with the knowledge that I have has been told to me that I have. Okay? But it does not mean land of tribute. You did not enslave or tribute people. That concept is a European concept. It comes from Europe. It originated in Europe, and it will, as far as I'm concerned, it can go back. Okay? Anything else? What else do I have here? Uh, I don't know, just some things. We make hats now, like that symbol. Just brought me there. Yeah. Uh, after your presentation, do you have jewelry and uh, books for sale? <laughs> we have lots of books for sale. This was a uh, book that uh, was uh, written by John Strong. It's a uh, Uncle Charles Indians of Eastern Long Island. It's a history book. Uh, it's got me on the back. <laughs> be glad to uh, have it for sale there. We can probably leave some here too. I'm on sale at the library allowed. They're all for sale here. It's a hardcover. Okay. We have um, another one by John Strong. It's called We Are Still Here. It's a paperback. Very reasonable. It's got me on the front here. I was a lot thinner then. Mm -hmm. A long time ago. Very what does cool. very reasonable mean? Huh? What does very reasonable mean? I don't know. What's reasonable to you? <laughs> 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 I think I'd go up a little more than that. <laughs> I was 14. Is that good? Can you hold two for me? Why don't you guys renegotiate? <laughs> we also have some. Uh, um, it's a novel. It was written by uh, Laura Strong. I don't know if I copy of it. It tells a story. If I have it here, it's a great story. Can these books be gotten through uh, an office that that your plan has, rather than going through our illustrious Amazon? Well, you come to my store and you can buy them there. I think they have my the Chinook Art Museum too. I think mm -hmm. you can over there too in Southampton. And. Uh, <coughs> Um, so, there's lots of places you can get them. Um, I want to show you this one, one book, it's really, really interesting. I have it. You also have the uh, the Gonkwa people of Long Island from the earliest times to 1700, also on sale. Okay. Oh, here it is. Here's one. This is a really fun book. It's a novel. It's called Spirit of the Terror. It's written by Laura Strong. It's a novel, but it's based upon a true story. Solomon Ward was a whaler who went on a journey. It's a historical event. You can look it up. <clears throat> and they were um, um, stranded. Their boat was, their whale ship, whale ship was um, um, destroyed in a storm. And they wound up off the coast of Hawaii for 11 months until they were rescued. And there were three Long Island um, native people on that boat. And uh, two of them were from Hunkachuk territory. I think 
think the uh, third, the other one was uh, the, uh, further out east. I'm not sure where it's from. But Solomon Ward was one of them, and they spent a lot of time on uh, um, out in the Hawaiian Islands uh, until they had got a boat that was there. So it's a great story. Um, you know, it's a fiction, but it's based on, uh, it's a novel, but it's based on uh, real life events. And uh, as my uncle and my cousin, Tree, would say, I got a lot of relatives in Hawaii, and every time I go there, they call me cousin, so. <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but something must have happened. <laughs> That's what he was fun to say, you know, so. It's a great story, uh, and if you like novels, it's a good one. Yes? Do you, does your clan um, have its own powwow annually, or do you go participate in other powwows? Well, nothing like Shinnecock powwow is probably one of the largest powwows here in North America. They do that event on Labor Day weekend. We have what we call June meeting, it occurs on the second Sunday of June, and it's basically, you know, for family and friends. Oh, okay. You know, and, uh, so it's not like a big public event. But you're taking part in the Shinnecock? Hmm? Yeah, you can go south and your people coming to Shinnecock? Sure. The chief is the leader of what? A nation? <coughs> or? He represents his people. Yeah, well, all right, his people. But, but people, would that be the nation or something else? Bless you. Some other reason. I don't understand your question. People are the well, nation. He means how far is your control? Is it just. I don't have any control. It's just. Right. So, I mean, I can't order people to do anything. So, so if you're talking about, like, your, your president? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> is it just your reservation? Or does it extend, are you chief? Just your reservation? Or do you extend? I think my, my, uh, my domain covers the entire island. So I would disagree. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as I'm concerned, you know, um, it's one of the things that I tell uh, people when they talk about uh, veterans. We, we volunteer to serve in the military, uh, more in numbers, greater than any other ethnic or, or uh, cultural group. And the reason is because one of our functions is to be a warrior, and a warrior is to defend the land and defend the people. And even though we are not in possession, we still believe we own it. And so we defend it. And it happens all the time. You've been in every war to defend the United States since 1756. Okay. Yeah. Pardon, pardon me for this. My, my ignorance is, is on display. Then who's who's the leader of the nation? The nation is controlled by a council. A council of seven people. One of those seven people is the chief. So your count, uh, chief is a council member as well. So I am a member of the council, yes. How, okay. long, do you, how long do you serve? Does one year. Oh, one year? Are you allowed to be over or does it transfer to re-elected? Re-elected. I've been re-elected for the last 24 years. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Four lives. Four. So the women like you then. Until you pass the The older women. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of kind of relate as far as I go because I was a post commander of my VFW post for 17 years. Same thing. Nobody wanted a job. It's hard. Where is your store, and can you order things online? Sure, you know, 207 Bruce Patek Main. You, you can order online too. You can go to, uh, what's, what's the website? Uh, it's uh, Bruce Patek Trading.com, I think. Bruce, yeah, I didn't know. What is it? Wow. Yeah. You can go to uh, www.wampamagic.com and uh, you can hit one of the links from the Bruce Patel Smoke Shop. And 
the training company, and uh, you can find all this stuff. It's including the coffee. We make our own coffee. Coffee. With everything else. Yes, sir. Uh, I had uh, read in that book that Indians have had frogs. Did they bring those over like, made like a bridge or a bay chain? Oh, yeah, it's part of our story, too. They had those dogs were um, very big and very um, untamed. And one of the first things the colonists did was to kill those dogs. Because number one, they were defenders of the people, and number two, they were warning that you were coming. And so the first thing they did was give it to those dogs. Military story. The dogs stood by, this, by that high, from what I understand. So they were cool. more closer descended to the wolf than a dog, from what I understand. And so one of the first things the college did was kill those dogs, exterminate them. Yeah. Okay, so, yes. On the uh, novel, is, uh, are the uh, Arkansas Central to the Story or Peripheral? On the Arkansas Central to the Story or Peripheral to what story? In the novel. Um, Solomon Ward is central to the story, and he's an Uncle Chuck sailor. So everything happens around him, right? The only events that take place are centered around him. He's a young boy. All the things that happened to him as a 14-year-old, first-time whaler, you know, tells him that story, okay? And so he's he's telling stories about, uh, about how his life was on the, on the res and uh, why he had to go whaling, you know, why he had to commit to, a, you know, a journey that may last a year and a half, <clears throat> you know, all those different things. And then what happens while he's on the boat, what happens when he's sailing and what happens with whaling and all those things. Thank you. So yeah, the story is central around him. <clears throat> What waters did your people fish in, or where, the, where do they fish now? How far? We fished as far as the whale trap. So out to Montauk and the up to the north, or? And up in Hawaii. Oh. That's our, that's our traditional fishing waters. <laughs> it's true. They followed the whale. That's our traditional fishing waters. Today, right now, are you still fishing for a while? You, virtually, you hunted them to virtual extinction. Mm -hmm. right? Last year, a couple of wilds showed up. Well, more than a couple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. No more hunt. No, but I think there is a, um, a, a an understanding that if the whales wash up along the shore for whatever reason, that uh, we still are able to claim the tail and the um, flukes for uh, several. But well, we don't hunt them. Yeah. Well, tail, well, tail, yeah. So that's where the power of the whale comes from. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll tell you another secret. Okay, another false history. Uh, we fish for, we're being prosecuted for fishing for eel, not just Uncajuk, but Shinnecock too. Mm -hmm. And um, the pilgrims in Massachusetts, when they survived during the winter, okay, let you know another little secret. It wasn't turkey, okay? It wasn't ham either. Okay, but there's a story in the book that just came out where Uncas taught the pilgrims how to fish for eel. They survived on eel. And they sat there like the, what they call the Elwise. It was so dense and so plentiful that he could sit in the stream with a net, handheld net, and catch a net full in less than 10 minutes. That's how plentiful it was. And so he taught them how to fish for that eel, and that's how they survived that first winter, fishing for eel. It's now been documented. But since they hunted it to virtual extinction and poisoned the water so badly that 
to use. <clears throat> uh, they, it's not on the endangered species list, but when we go out and do it in our way, we're called criminals. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. What about the myth, uh, uh, mostly among the Hopis, but a few other tribes too, and not only Native Americans, but other indigenous groups throughout the planet, that uh, there have been four previous extinctions of humanity on Earth, and that humanity, uh, during the course of one cycle, they go through five psychological stages, and that uh, during the current epoch, we're, we're, we're at the end of the uh, fifth cycle. That's beyond my pay grade. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Way beyond my pay grade. You got to talk to some Hopi about that. Uh, I'm a simple human being. <laughs> trying to keep going. Anything from Lake Ronkonkoma that? Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I grew up on the lake, so I have to. I grew up with the lake on my okay. doorstep, so I got to. Okay. Besides all the. <laughs> one book, yeah. You believe the story? No, outside of what I could find, you know. I'll tell you, let me tell you, there's no truth to it. Okay. Anytime you want to tell a story about people that don't exist anymore, you say that the woman fell in love with some guy. <laughs> no, it works, right? Mm -hmm. Right? And then uh, father objected to it, so she drowns, she drowns him every year. <laughs> she should fall in love with more guys. <laughs> So, you know, it's, 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 it's not true because it is a way that you can trivialize the fact that people lived in that area, there may have been a sacred place, there may have been people buried there, and you build them on the houses, and so you make up a story that satisfies your purian interest so that you don't have to recognize the seriousness of the location of the terror. I live in one. And that's what it's about. Yeah. Was there any purpose to the lake? That, was, was there any purpose to the lake to the local nations or? Ronkonkoma is because our dialect, Ronkonkoma, it means big, it's deep lake. That's what it means in language. Big lake. Literally. It's our dialect, so it's a connection to the. Lake Ronkonkoma. So yeah, the connection to the Delta. Like seven minutes down the road. It's a kettle lake, glacier. You said you don't have a traditional powwow. Uh, I didn't say that. I said I didn't have a big powwow like to have a Shinnecock that you public gets invited to. <laughs> I said public's not invited to that. No public events? No public. Uh, nothing like that. Do you have any public events? Um, we have some socials, but uh, small, most of small events. Yeah. How do you say the name of the Maker's Aware? How do you look at it? Yeah, we're building a new community center that will uh, probably accommodate some visitors and so on you know, in that way. Yeah. So I envision that. I see that as a so place to come in and have a museum in that. In that um, on that site in that location. And there are places that are in the area that reflect some of our history. If you go to the uh, Wertheim National Wildlife Refuge, um, that new building they built, that $54 million building you paid for? It? <laughs> you remember paying for that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Well, if you go there, you'll see they have an exhibit of Long Island aquaculture and so on. And in the beginning of that exhibit, is talk about us and have a wampum belt there and have some history. Is it done well? I said? Is it done well? I mean, is it done pretty well? Oh, it's done pretty well, yeah. It's done pretty well, yeah. And where exactly are you from? <laughs> <laughs> You're on my land. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's where I'm from. <laughs> I'm not sure everywhere. They're 6,000 years old. They're made out of the same material, whether they're in... Uh, uh, Master Piqua or Kocha, oh. same material, they're made the same way. Because they have them in the museums. They have them in the museums. They don't bring any of that kind of stuff here. A lot of, a lot of the things they got from the museums. Right, so if you put a shovel in the ground, chances are you're digging up stuff, right? Mm -hmm. That's what's happening so today. I seem to remember five or six decades ago, you guys gave a few powwows. They didn't last long, though. 
Well, I think there was one in the middle of the summertime they had one over by the firehouse. They used to do that over there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they used to have a July call up. Um, they don't have that anymore. Mm -hmm. I think they have one that goes that's further down in Bayshore. Call that the uh, Homanonki Pawa or over there. That's in August. You, know, you probably see a lot of uh, people from here, from Shanghai, you know, uh, um, New York City had a big one in October that was uh, very well um, received. They had, a, they had um, maybe a hundred or so, hundred or so dancers. People came from all over, uh, uh, a people, and it's supposed to be a traditional, more supposed to be like a every year event, annual event now. It was held at the Armory. Um, there's um, there's one in Brooklyn also, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Uh, they have one in, um, so, you know, they, 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 powwow.com, I think, they got a calendar of you know, all the different events you can go to. Check them all out. Um. Yes. A few years ago, we had Red Hawk here. Uh, we have a park outdoors, and they also are uh, dancers and perform. Who are you talking about? Red saying? Hawk. Red Hawk? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, you want to hire us? We can take a whole team out here to do that. No problem. You can come and do, do a demonstration, a program. Sure. That you can do. Absolutely. We do that all the time. That's done all the time. Great, yes. <laughs> In fact, there's a troupe that's done. It's a combination of Uncatog, Shinnecock, and I think um, there's a guy from uh, North Carolina who's part of it. And they come together and they do, they demonstrate the different style of dance and song. And that could be something that <laughs> I would recommend that you have that there, you'd be more than more than happy with the, with the way in which, and it gives an explanation for everything too, so you have an understanding, a better understanding than what you see on TV and in Hollywood. I can guarantee you that. Okay, yes. In the 1990s, we attended a lecture by Chief Lone Otter. Chief Lone Otter, Chief my Lone. predecessor, my mentor, absolutely. And yes. when I saw you were here, it brought back the path that. Mm -hmm. He helped put us yeah, on. He was a very powerful I person. He had a lot of wisdom you. and a lot of knowledge. He was my mentor and my predecessor. And, uh, um, he taught me the creation story of our people was I learned from him. And he took the name Lone Otter. Mm -hmm. It's in part of his vision that the otter is central to the creation of, uh, of, all that, all of life, of living things. Uh, yeah. You know, so uh, a lot of respect for him. He died prematurely. He had uh, yeah, debilitating diabetes, diabetes and, uh, he died from the uh, effects. Yeah, we have his book. As a matter of fact, my wampum factory that I built, we restored his gun shop. That's where the wampum factory is. He used to be an expert gunsmith. Like all the cops used to come in uh, and have, he'd have hair trigger designs and, you know, and all the young police. And we had a couple of, we had one who was a county police and the other one who was a sheriff from, the, from, my, from our, our, our people. Uh, he, he was a gunsmith. He, uh, everybody, hunters, uh, police, everyone, you know, uh, came to that shop. And um, when he died, I rented it from his children and we restored it, not to make guns, to make one. So it's pretty cool the connection to that. Everything comes back, you know, so the story is connected. Okay, so 2.30. <laughs> okay, let's um